they require all of us to sort of play a part in, in trying to decide how best to, to, to address these challenges in the future. We know that the world's population is continuing to grow every single year. It's supposed to be about 9 billion by 2040. So we've just got a lot more people uh, and a growing demand for, for metals, uh, minerals and metals. Um, like it or not, geology determines the location of mineral and metal deposits. Uh, so we don't really control exactly where these things are. Uh, we'll talk about some more local examples a little bit later in the talk. But uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes minerals are located in, in politically unstable regions, uh, regions where we do have some of these other challenges. Uh, and there has been arguments made that perhaps we should be trying to encourage you know, more development of resources closer to where we actually live, close to home here, for example, within Canada, uh, you know, where we have uh, stricter regulations on things like environmental and social issues. Um, substitution, recycling, and usage efficiency are going to just be essential. We will have to do a better job of that in the future. And, uh, you know, this demand is, is, is likely to increase unless we make those changes. Um, it's in a general rule, the most obvious mineral deposits, whether we're talking about elements like rare earths or cobalt or copper or, or uh, zinc or gold, the most obvious deposits have been discovered. So anything close to surface, you know, we've got very good technologies for, for doing exploration these days. There's a lot of very, very smart people out there searching for these deposits. And now, you know, companies are being forced to actually look to increasing depths and, uh, you know, to lower grade deposits where you have a much higher percentage of, of mine waste that's uh, uh, developed uh, when these mines are, are, are being developed uh, in the future. And finally, we, we really do need to come up with new methods and technologies for recovering metals, not just from primary sources like new mines, but from existing waste streams. So, you know, this could be existing mine waste or other things, you know, waste streams, whether there are garbage dumps, you know, from municipal sources, or even things like uh, people looked at stuff like sewage sludge or, or um, uh, you know, um, things that have been produced, for example, from power plants and other things, so coal fly ash and other sources, we really do need to look uh, uh, and, and get a bit smarter about how we're doing that in the future. So here in Canada, uh, you know, we do, if, if, you know, there's a whole bunch of different mining, uh, you know, Canada is, is a country that obviously has had uh, a very diverse uh, mining hit history for, for uh, uh, you know, hundreds of years now. Uh, and if we go back, I mean, obviously we're all sitting here, you know, in the, uh, uh, in Mi'kma'ki, it's a, you know, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I mean, even before European, uh, Europeans showed up on these shores, you know, people were looking around for some of these sorts of resources and, and using them, arguably in a much more sustainable fashion way back when. Um, but, you know, as our society has expanded and our, our uses have become uh, greater and greater for various elements, um, one of the things you see on this map, there's a lot of details here, obviously, but the green squares, for example, show where we have active mines across the country that are producing various elements that are considered critical these days. So things like nickel, copper, cobalt, uh, you know, lithium, graphite, and then we have uh, smelter refineries producing a, a variety of things like aluminum or nickel and cobalt in various areas across the country. And then all the blue dots are advanced projects. So these are where mining companies, you know, are not yet in production, but which there has been ore deposits that have been uh, considered to be economic, which they're, you know, they're doing the studies and actually trying to potentially bring some of these into production. So you'll see on this map, and I'm going to talk specifically about Nova Scotia in the next couple of slides, but, you know, the only one that really kind of makes the list here with respect to critical metals at present, where the, the, the sort of project is far enough along that the companies have done sort of the, the research is uh, a deposit in southwest Nova Scotia, which is uh, down around uh, East Kentville, where, you know, there's, there's tin, tungsten, indium, or potentially gallium that could be produced to help meet some of these demands going forward in the future. So at present, yeah, um, as you see on the right, you know, Canada, I mean, we, we are a leading global producer of a variety of different uh, elements like potash, that's an essential uh, component, for example, of uh, fertilizers. 
Uh, we're actually the second leading producer in the world of niobium and uranium, and we produce uh, uh, the third largest amount of palladium and titanium, sort of on down the list. So, you know, the mining has been an essential part of our economy, but again, you know, uh, things have changed over time. Many of you will be familiar with that. Now the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency is now the Impact Assessment Agency. You know, the bar with respect to, you know, how projects are, are assessed with regards to their impact, not just on the environment, but on communities and indigenous peoples and others, you know, that there's a much broader uh, series of things that need to be considered. And that really actually go into whether a project is, is truly economic or not. And that input from communities uh, is absolutely essential from day one. So here in Nova Scotia, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure given the, the title of the talk, many you want to sort of get some sense anyways of, of what, what's the picture closer to home. And so this is a map uh, as of 2018 and some of the, again, the more recent, most recent data I could find just on active uh, mining operations in, in Nova Scotia. And so uh, many of you will know that uh, most mining at present in Nova Scotia is not actually for metals, but it's it's dominated by far uh, by industrial minerals and structural materials. And so these include things, for example, like gypsum, uh, limestone, salt, which we're obviously spreading on the roads these days, uh, uh, coal, um, the Dawkin mine up at Cape Breton recently closed uh, uh, production, but we do still have a bit of production around Stellarton there. And then, of course, we do uh, have two gold mines, one here here in Moose River that opened in 2017, and the Dufferin Deposit, a much smaller mine that's located on the south shore near Sheet Harbor uh, that are, are producing gold at present. So, um, you know, some people are surprised, you know, until they take off on a plane from the Halifax airport, because we often don't see, you know, uh, the evidence, uh, unless you live in some of these rural areas of this mining activity. But in fact, for example, uh, Nova Scotia has been a major gypsum producer for years and years. We actually have uh, North America's largest gypsum mine out in East Milford. And uh, for those of us that work at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography, we're all very, very used to waiting for the train, which takes actually the gypsum from from this big open pit and puts it on ships in Halifax Harbor and ships it off to international markets. And so, you know, there, there is, we do have a history of some mining going back, you know, 300 years in this province and likely more, um, but, uh, but not a lot uh, in recent years uh, for, for various uh, metal commodities. Um, if we look at advanced exploration and development projects, um, there is, a, you know, there are a few deposits. So these, these are ones where companies, again, have, uh, they're a bit further along. These are not just exploration uh, sites, you know, where, you know, there are a whole variety of different mineral occurrences around the province. Um, but, you know, these are ones where companies have tried to sort of develop uh, a larger case and, and, and perhaps uh, enter the environmental assessment process to try and actually bring some of these deposits into production. And so, you know, I mentioned the tin and indium deposit down uh, around East Kentville here. Um, there's also a new gypsum deposit uh, uh, located here. But also, uh, many of you will know, I'm sure, uh, that there are at least four additional gold deposits that have been proposed for future development. Uh, one in Goldboro, uh, and then three more in Cochrane Hill, 15 Mile Stream, and Beaver Dam um, that uh, companies like Anaconda and Atlantic Gold uh, are currently in the process of, of, of trying to develop. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future, but those are the only projects uh, that are currently uh, in the near future, um, the ones that are, are, are being considered for development, but there's certainly uh, exploration underway for a, a wide variety of different things, including cobalt, copper, lithium, even potentially rare earth elements. There are resources that do exist around the province, but none of these are really all that close to uh, reaching sort of an advanced exploration or development stage. And so, uh, and then we still do, as I mentioned before, have a moratorium on uranium mining and exploration as well. So, you know, these are the only ones that are sort of on the current radar screen in the next few years. 
So I'm going to switch gears here now. Uh, and uh, uh, sort of the latter part of my talk is going to summarize quickly some of the re research that we've done on the environmental impacts of, of uh, gold mining in Nova Scotia. I'm going to talk about our work on historical gold mine sites, a little bit of sort of about the current situation and how some of this information could be used in the future. So, you know, many Nova Scotians aren't aware that we actually uh, had a, a very active gold mining industry between the 1860s and 1940s here in Nova Scotia. And, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of activity between then and, and, and uh, really the last few years with Moose River. But this is one photo, for example, that was taken in 1902 up near uh, Isaac's Harbor on the eastern shore of the Dolliver Mountain Mine. It just gives you an idea of the scale of these operations. And there was a large mill where they crushed the ore in the back, and then some of the mine waste was actually just sort of slurred into a pond in the foreground. So, um, you know, there, there are roughly 64 historical gold districts uh, across mainland Nova Scotia, and uh, uh, the past producing districts are all sort of shown with yellow dots. The larger scale deposits uh, are shown with stars here. And this evening, uh, I'm just going to focus, this is just a very small set of a larger talk that I've given uh, on uh, our past research on Nova Scotia gold deposits. I'll provide a link to a YouTube version of that talk uh, later, later this evening here. But uh, I'm going to talk about the Montague gold mine uh, site here, uh, just on the outskirts of, of uh, the Halifax area, as well as the Goldenville site, both of which have recently been uh, uh, chosen for remediation. Um, and uh, I talked a little bit, Moose Land, I just put that on this map here anyways, was the site where gold was first discovered in Nova Scotia in, in 1858. And as you can see, most of these are located uh, sort of in the southwestern part of the province in what, what's called the Maguma Supergroup. So it occurs with slate and quartzite. Um, there are three main types of gold deposits in Nova Scotia. And the first one is what was historically produced most commonly were high grade quartz veins. So by high grade, you know, these were veins that might contain as much as say 15 grams per ton gold. Uh, this is what the historical miners were after. And uh, they, they did most of this through underground mining where they they'd, uh, drill a shaft from the surface or sometimes go in horizontally in, in hilly terrain. Uh, but more recently, companies like Atlantic Gold, uh, they're after what are called sort of low-grade disseminated gold, either in meta sandstone or slate. And this is where the grades are much, much lower. So, you know, I think Atlantic Gold are currently producing gold um, at a variety of different uh, uh, ton, uh, uh, grades, but, you know, it might be more, say, in the one to two grams per ton of gold. So, you know, for reference, that means, you know, if you want one gram of gold, you're producing a ton of waste rock to get that one gram of Gold. So, you know, they're, they're lower grade deposits and you know, they do tend to have, uh, you know, they produce quite a bit more waste relative to what the historical uh, much higher grade quartz veins would have produced. So uh, most of the historical production was fairly close to surface. You know, the key minerals that are in these deposits are things like quartz and various types of carbonate minerals. But importantly, they also have various sulfide minerals. And one of the most common actually in gold deposits in Nova Scotia is shown on the lower left here, is a mineral called arsenopyrite. And so this is a mineral that is composed of iron, arsenic, and sulfur. And so this is why you often hear uh, you know, of challenges associated with arsenic uh, in Nova Scotia gold deposits, because the arsenic is naturally occurring in the ground. It formed as a part of the gold deposit, and it needs to be managed very carefully carefully or if you're developing these deposits in the future. So just again, a quick bit of history here. I, I mentioned gold was first discovered in 1858. There's been essentially sort of three main gold rushes historically. Uh, the first was, you know, around the 1860s, uh, in, in the 1860s, you know, when people were very, uh, they'd heard about the California gold rush. Uh, you know, there were some legislative changes here in Nova Scotia around that time. Everybody thought they could make it rich and there was a huge uh, amount of exploration and staking that went on. 
And then people quickly realized this wasn't as easy as they thought. You know, gold nuggets weren't just lying around on the ground and there was a wane of activity. The second gold rush was really driven by improvements in technology, especially uh, the use of new technology. So a lot of the original gold was recovered using mercury through a process called amalgamation. Uh, in the second gold rush, they started to use cyanide, which is very effective for dissolving gold and, and can be uh, a very uh, effective means of actually recovering uh, gold from a variety of different minerals. And then there was a third gold rush just before the Second World War, and then everybody sort of went off to the war. And then there was a, a bit of small production from places like the Sterling Mine in Cape Breton, and, and actually a previous period of operation in the 1980s at the Cochrane Hill deposit. But I recently updated this just to give you some sense. This is the, the last couple of bars on this plot here. So this goes from 1860 all the way up to 2020. This is the last couple of years of production at the Tukoi deposit in Moose River. Um, and so in each of the last couple of years, 